Welcome to another obnoxious episode of Beer and Politics. We are your autumnal hosts, Ryan and Ryan. Today we're talking about victims and victimization. Who's a victim? Is he a victim? Am I a victim? What is a victim? But of course, before we do, Adam Brewmaster, what do we have on tap today? Today we are drinking Nom Nom by Barley Forge. So Nom Nom is a mango wheat beer brewed here in close by Costa Mesa, California from Barley Forge Brewing Company. Now, so this is a wheat beer brewed with mango. So something similar to a Hefeweizen and it's gonna clock in at 5.8% alcohol. So what do you think? I like the 5.8% alcohol. I think that's a nice middle of the road, better than Bud Light <laughs> alcohol level. <laughs> uh, I actually like the beer quite a bit. Uh, I think the mango is nice and refreshing. Mm -hmm. uh, we were actually talking about the difference between this and maybe more of a German style Hefeweizen. Um, it is definitely flatter on notes. It is not full bodied at all. Um, I do like that it's clearly not filtered. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would recommend this beer. I like it. So this beer for me, it actually misses almost every note. I, uh, I mean, the color's great. It looks good. It's got a good head. That's all nice in a, in a beer like this. Mm -hmm. But um, I, it's very it, one note. Yeah, it's, it's very one note. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of redeeming qualities to it, actually. The, um, the mango for me misses, mm. and it just tastes like a separate flavor that's in there for the sake of being in there. Um, not, not a big fan of this beer, actually. Oh, we're going to disagree. I like the mango. <laughs> so, I didn't care for it. No? Not no. a fan? Adam Brewmaster's actually drinking something okay. else behind the camera. I think I could drink <laughs> quite a few of these. Uh, but by quite a few, I mean three, maybe. Sure. Uh, I'm not a big fruit guy, but I, I think the mango is not overpowering. Mm -hmm. It gives it a note that you wouldn't have <laughs> without it. Without it. It is the one note I taste, and I kind of like it. All right. What, uh, what would you give it? I give it three and a half Angry Clowns, <laughs> because it is out right now. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually going to give this, um, I'm going to give this two red balloons. Mm, that's sad. Yeah. Well, cheers. Thanks to Barley Forge anyway. Sure. He liked it. Yep. I'll keep drinking it. And I'll keep drinking it too. <laughs> and we are not sponsored by them. Keep that in mind. I know you're probably thinking we should be, and you're right, but we're not. All right. So that brings us to today's topic du jour. All right, we're talking about victimization. This comes to us by way of conservatives, and more specifically, Ben Shapiro at least mentions it. And his whole thing is that there are no victims in America today. And he says that because he doesn't care about you. He cares about his wife and his child, but he doesn't care about you. And largely, nobody cares about you. There's not one single individual that cares about you, which means you have ample opportunity to succeed because if they don't care about you, they're not trying to stop you. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to really the difference between individuals and entities. So when we're talking about victimhood here, mm -hmm. we're really talking about racism. And yes. Yeah. yeah well, who's, who's a victim if, if black people are a victim of racism? And, uh, you know, to Ben Shapiro's point, it's true. A lot of people don't care about you. A lot of individuals don't care enough to openly try to discriminate against you. Certainly some do. And in those cases, we, I think we would say, sure, someone is a victim in that case. Sure. But um, what he's overlooking is, is the systemic level of racism. And I know people are going to say, oh, systemic, it's not a thing. Right. We don't but, have that anymore. <laughs> right. But the, the, the issue is that if you, have, if you have people who are racists, and we know we do, mm -hmm. if you have people who are racists in any amount, that leads to systemic racism because those people are a part of the system, whether you like it or not, whether it be government or whether it just be the local shop owner. That's part of the system where you're not going to be treated well. Or the person who votes. <laughs> or the person who votes to keep in people who maybe aren't voting for your interests. Correct. And, and if you're not convinced that people in the system that are racist or that have perhaps discriminatory views can, can make a difference, then just look at the immigration policy of the United States before and after Trump. And of course, not everyone is as powerful as the president. But this is someone who is in government, someone who is a part of the system, mm -hmm. people voting to change the way things work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are going to say, oh, but Muslims isn't a race. You know what I'm talking about. Stop oh. being so pedantic. It's called sentiment. <laughs> sentiment. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things Ben also talks about is there's this idea that we don't have racism because we've got laws set up to protect it. Sure. That if you are if you are discriminated against in employment, you can file a complaint. It's against the law. People can be fined. But but that really is a couple of things. That the number one, it only helps after the fact. It doesn't stop it from happening. It provides possible recourse. And 
<laughs> Actually, let's do a little little scenario real quick, right? Okay, I'm excited. Um, I, I want you to be the investigator, and I'm going to be the person accused of employment discrimination. Okay. Okay, so there were two people that came in, asked me, asked me why I hired the white guy and not the black guy. They have the same resume, by the way. So um, I'm just taking notes here. Feel mm -hmm. free to speak openly. You are not under arrest at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, why did you hire the white guy and not the black guy? Oh, he answered this one question better. Mm. Fair enough. Done. See, these things are really difficult to prove. Mm. And in order to prove them, you need an enormous amount of government, bureaucracy, and money to be spent. Mm, money. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you really want to spend a lot of money on, mm -hmm. small government person? Probably not. That's a great point. Thanks. And largely, what matters even more is that in this scenario, you've been denied an opportunity. Yep. And it's all about opportunity. Opportunity is really about the only thing that matters. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that there's no such thing as personal responsibility. Yes, if you are not personally responsible, if you are not actively trying to better yourself, you will not do it. But if that opportunity is not there or does not present itself, you will have no opportunity to do so. And when we're talking about opportunity and who is a victim of not having opportunity, mm -hmm. we can look at a couple of things. Number one, has the government helped move your family to undesirable areas? In the past, mm. did those areas get passed over for government grants or for subsidies? Has the lower values of property in those areas affected school funding mm. in your area? And really, does living there afford you the same opportunity that it affords other people? Because keep in mind, when we're talking about location, location is a huge part of what opportunity is. And we know the government spent billions upon billions of dollars making sure that white families had nice new places to live. And they spent billions upon billions of dollars of corralling black people and taking them to places that white people didn't want. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so if you were born into an area that no one wants, even though that wasn't done to you, it was done to your parents or to your parents' parents. If you're born in that area where there is no opportunity because it was removed, then yeah, you're a victim of that. Mm -hmm. And how much, that may remain to be seen, but you're certainly some kind of a victim there. So you're actually talking right there about something I think people overlook, and I'll get to that in just a second. But, uh, you know, I think the issue that we run into, and we see this uh, beyond just the word a victim, uh, and we'll actually have a separate video on this, I think. But the problem that people have is when a word is used too much, they stop even paying attention to the word. So the word victim is, it has no weight to the right. And the reason is, is because when you say I'm a victim, the argument is, well, we're all victims of something, huh. right? Everybody's sure. a victim of something. There is at least, no matter how small it is, right? There was something in your life that probably prevented you from being the ultimate you. Maybe a teacher who, who didn't nurture you enough, a drunk father, um, being in poverty, that's bigger, an abusive parent. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what it is, but we can all just raise our hands and say, we're victims. And it's kind of like when you say everything is priority one, mm. that's the same as saying nothing's a priority. <laughs> nothing. Right, absolutely nothing's a priority. So if So your choices are everyone's a victim or no one's a victim. So when you say it, it holds no weight uh, to a lot of conservatives. Um, and the key here is, if you're going to say it, you need to say what you're a victim of. Because mm. they just hear victim, like, well, I'm a victim too. No, say what you're a victim of. Because that's empirically identifiable and measurable mm. of race discrimination. Oh, really? How so? You can describe it. Now we have a conversation. But when you just say victim, it's noise. Nobody cares. All right. Number two is that we don't know what victimization is anymore. We think of victimizing as an action that is currently happening. And this goes back to what you said. But we've, we've forgotten that there's such a thing as victim of circumstance. That's an actual phrase. We've all heard it. I'm a victim of circumstance. Circumstance is not something that is a verb. It's not actually happening to you. I'm not doing it to you. No, you are born into it, or you fell into it, or you walked into it. But here's the circumstance that you are in. And so we overlook that, though when we're talking about a lot of racial discrimination and things that have happened to people, we're talking about circumstances that they are born into. And when we talk about victimization and victims, the definition of a victim is 
someone that is subject to oppression, they're subject to mistreatment, and they're subject to hardship. Oppression, by the way, is hardship that is perpetrated by someone in authority, right, in an authoritative position. So when we talk about oppression, a lot of people say, well, it ended with Jim Crow. That's Everybody else now has that opportunity that Ben Shapiro is talking about. So what I want to do is looking at the victims of circumstance and victims of oppression. And I really like hardship here because circumstances create hardship. Uh, I, I'm going to look at the generations that have happened since Jim Crow because that's when it all ended, right? right. So how many, how many generations is that really? Because everyone says, well, you've had all this time. Well, the answer is three generations. My parents were the first generation born right at the end of Jim Crow. Then there's me, and then there's my children. So we're looking at three generations to get our shit together. That's, that's the argument here. So let's look at each generation to figure out if they really had that opportunity to get their shit together, or are they victims of hardship based on their circumstances? All right, so if we look at the first generation, my parents' generation, uh, I would say clearly they are victims of hardship because I think there's an assumption here that when Jim Crow ends, like everybody was just like, here you go, opportunity abounds. It's open fields and butterflies. That's right. Yeah, milk and honey coming your way. That's even better. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, but that's not the case. All it is is a uh, is a Supreme Court ruling that says you can't practice separate but equal anymore. And this was through Brown versus the Board of Education. That's where we're kind of ending Jim Crow 1954. Mm -hmm. All right. So they're saying. They made a ruling, but that didn't mean all the racists in the world stopped being racist. <laughs> right. That didn't mean you can go to your local grocer and he's going to obviously let you buy something. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to a restaurant and they're going to obviously let you sit down. Because they still know it requires money and it requires legal action. And it requires effort for you to make an argument. And it's recourse, but it's putting all the effort on you and they're daring you to do it. So the opportunity that we're afforded to, let's say I was black, to my black parents when they were born probably isn't really there to get ahead, right? We know that the integration of schools didn't really happen until 1970, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. So they're born, uh, remember, uh, separate but equal ended, 1954. They are born, how much money did their parents have? Probably little, right? Because we're saying that was hardship. Right. So they're born into that hardship, and then they have to get out of that hardship. And I've just told you, we know that there was a lot of upheaval in the 60s <laughs> because hardship was still there. So. The first generation probably victims still. All right, so now the question is, am I a victim? All right, well, I'm gonna say yes, because we just discussed it. My parents didn't have an opportunity really to start obtaining wealth and income, and we know that helps with opportunities of other things, educational opportunities, right? Um, this is fictional Black Ryan. Yeah, way. fictional Black Ryan. Actually, I wanna play a game for that first group, okay. the first generation real fast here. If if you're if you're born in 1960, okay, so you're the first generation after Jim Crow, mm -hmm. all right, you're still white. You're okay. still white Ryan in this scenario. And right before you were born, your dad was a multimillionaire, mm -hmm. and his partner, uh, business partner, embezzled all of his money and left your family penniless. Okay. All right. Is your dad a victim? Uh, yes. Is your mom a victim? Yes. Are you a victim, though? It's not your money. <laughs> Clearly, I would be. You would be a victim. So you're a victim because now you don't have the money that you should have had, right? Correct. Okay, so the first generation, they didn't have money they should have had because we prevented them from having the money. And so their children, growing up in the same hardship, just like you would have been had mm. someone embezzled your dad's money. Mm -hmm. All right, so now back to me. I'm suffering under that hardship too because though my parents had more opportunity, we know there was a lot of fighting even after the end of Jim Crow to get opportunities. And we're going to talk about that in another video as well. All right, so I'm, I'm under hardship. What about my kids? That's the third generation, the only other generation that exists outside after Jim Crow. What about them? I'm going to argue that they have a lot more opportunity today. All right, the third generation. Um, because I think me, even growing up in hardship, I do think there was a lot less fighting mm. for my success and my opportunity. And they're even going to have less fighting for their success and their opportunity. So I think if we're gonna be fair and we say, you might be playing the victim card too much, it's only this generation, just this one. So don't say it's been so long since Jim Crow. And, and only maybe. And, yeah, and it's only maybe this generation. So if you're gonna be angry, maybe at this generation, okay, but don't tell me it's been so long, it's been this generation. But if you're not sure if that's even fair, we're gonna play another game. All right.
of games. So let's say me and a bunch of my white friends start a game of Monopoly. All mm -hmm. right. And we, we go around the board 14 times. And then we invite our black friend to join us. <laughs> and he says, how many times do I get to go around since you guys have gone around 14 times? What would be the fair answer, you think? I, think, uh, I would think 14 would be equitable. Oh, you don't think it's three? <laughs> no. Oh, you don't, huh? Because we have had 14 generations of slavery slash uh, Jim Crow and only three of not that. So you recognize playing Monopoly, 14 sounds about right to start to, before you stop bitching, right? <laughs> right. I think that's fair. So before we say stop bitching, maybe we should give them 14 generations. <laughs> now, that's not to say. And by the way, that even might be aggressive, knowing that I'm still going to play the game of Monopoly. And, that you're, and especially that you're still 14 ahead. Yes. And I'm going to keep playing. I'm not going to wait for them to go 14. I'm going to say, yeah, you can start going two, and after 14, you stop bitching. Oh. But I'll still be always 14 ahead. And any time that they might accidentally get an extra turn, you're like, no, no, that's not fair. Mm. That's right. That's right. And I might create laws where you always land on community tax or something. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, I'm in charge. Yeah. I have all the money. Um, <laughs> and this is not to say. Capitalism. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and this is not to say, by the way, that, again, this, and this is problem people have with the victim card, right? We're not saying excuse people for not taking advantage of the opportunities they have. You still, I mean... This is where Ben Shapiro is absolutely right. The easiest way that you personally can change your circumstance is by you personally changing your circumstance. Yes. Right? It's just disingenuous to say, we have no impact on your circumstance. We've never had it. Or we did, but it was a long time ago, and now nobody's racist. And by the way, when he says, I don't care about you, I'm not the problem. No, the fact that you don't care is the problem. Because when you say nobody cares about you, you are saying all those people who are still alive who were alive during Jim Crow. On the and racist side. On right? the racist side. And all the people who are still alive after Jim Crow during the 60s. And all the other racist people in the world don't exist as part of those entities he's talking about. They don't vote for entities that serve their interests, which are racist interests, and they don't certainly hold political office or positions of power in general. Yes, and, they, sure. and, and the other thing is, uh, and this came up today, when people say, oh, I'm a victim, uh, uh, everybody's a victim. Yeah, we do have victims. We have fat people. We have tall people. We have women. We have gays. We have lesbians. We have all these people, and there's, they're all victims in different ways, especially from the government. But we're not talking about them necessarily today. We're actually talking about victims of racial discrimination. That's it. And it, denying that that exists is unhelpful. If you don't care, just say that. If you say, listen, it's not priority one. It's gotten so much better. It's priority six. It's priority ten. It's I don't even care. But don't tell us it doesn't happen, and it doesn't exist. Right. Like if if uh, if you were to go live in uh, you know the the remains of Chernobyl now, mm. it doesn't mean that bad things wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like like yes, it happened a long time ago, but it was something that was uh, you know we'll say perpetrated by their government. But it's a wasteland. Yep. Even if you live there now, I would say that you're still a victim of that. Mm -hmm. We might call that a hardship. Mm -hmm. And if it was from an oppressive authority, the unjust hardship. Mm. Mm. True. All right. Uh, final call? No. All right. Cheers, Cheers my friend. my friend. We want to thank you guys for watching. Until next time, it's just beer. And politics. <laughs>